Thank you. And, you know, I'm still getting over. Thank you, Alina, for sharing. And thank you, everybody who's already started to donate. Like, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful human thing, compassionate thing. So, honestly, thank you. Um, all right. So, today I'm going to talk to you about staying human while coding. Uh, I do think it's possible, believe it or not. Uh, so, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Taksumike. Uh, okay, hopefully I got that close enough. Uh, really happy to be here uh, to see you all. Thank you so much to the organizers. Um, I'm one of those special uh, meal people uh, with vegan, so I really appreciate the accommodating nature and all of that. And um, thanks uh, just for all of you to be here. It's great to see actual faces in person. Um, it's been a while since I've seen this many in the same room, so uh, that's really wonderful. How about anyone else? Is this anybody's first in-person conference since the pandemic? A big kind of event? Anybody show of hands? I can actually see people, so it's kind of nice. A lot of people, right? So it's kind of amazing, right? Maybe a little overwhelming, but also pretty amazing. Um, and also, though, welcome to the people who are joining from home. Uh, great to have you here as well. Uh, I know for me, as a speaker who's often talking about human issues in tech, uh, it has been challenging to try to reach out to people uh, only through digital means. Uh, this quote uh, comes from an article that came out in 2020. When I see that technological platforms such as Zoom provide some imitations of face-to-face -face interaction, what I notice the most is that I miss the three-dimensional faces and the bodies and the eyes and the breaths. And it comes from a professor, and I really identified with this quote. Uh, and I, I now, you know, <laughs> three years on, <laughs> um, it's really nice to return to things like this where we can really connect. Um, so, which is why I was happy to come here to your beautiful country from San Diego. I left behind, you know, the palm trees and the beaches. Um, I'm very excited to be here in the snow. Um, so, thank you for welcoming me. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, I have spent the past uh, 15 years working in tech, in software engineering and technical leadership. I mention this because I'm going to be talking about human topics, but my background is in engineering. Uh, so, you know, hopefully, hopefully that helps to, to mention that. Uh, so, you know, in all this time, I've noticed some problems in tech. Uh, unproductive conflict on teams, a lot of, you know, butting heads there. Uh, burnout, hitting the wall is what I hear you often call it here elitism and hostility toward beginners, uh, that gatekeeping idea, socially harmful products, and unwelcoming work environments where some people who don't fit the stereotype of what a developer looks like or acts like often don't feel as welcome. So that's why I started my company in 2016, so a while back now, uh, to bring more compassion to tech uh, through training, through speaking, uh, workshops that I do at companies and that sort of thing. Uh, with, the, with the goal of helping to alleviate some of these issues. So some of you may immediately have the response, but I'm not a people person. I work on back-end code, perhaps. Why should I care about this soft and fuzzy stuff? Uh, and it's okay if you think that, uh, no worries. I would have been among you not too many years ago. Uh, this is from something I posted on Facebook in my uh, perhaps less enlightened days. Uh, after getting back from a phone call, my coworker said, I hate people, no wonder we get along. <laughs> Um, so, of course, there's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek nature there, but I do think that uh, I, I, I would have identified with that sort of objection. In tech, we often have this concept that the hard skills are what really matters, and the soft skills kind of nice to have, but maybe we don't respect as much. And I will say this, the truth is you don't have to care about humans. <laughs> I bet you didn't expect me to say that, but it's true. You really don't have to. And I'm not here to tell you what you should do, because I don't think that's compassionate either. And so that's, that's, that's n really not the intention of this talk. What it is, though, is to say, point out that you are a human, working with humans, to create products for humans. So it might help to think about human issues and how they relate to the work that we do every day. And one note for people who work on developer tools, developers also count as humans. That's part of it here. So thinking about these uh, skills, uh, human skills, uh, will help you communicate effectively in code reviews, name variables with empathy. Yes, I mentioned variables and empathy in the same uh, breath here, uh, because I do think that naming variables, you know, again, it's not for the computer, right? They don't really care. It's for the people who will read our code. Uh, resolving conflicts with coworkers, coping with uncertainty and stress, which is everywhere <laughs> these days, it seems. Rallying support for or opposing a new tool or process, a very human problem. Staying motivated while learning new technologies. 
uh, mentoring uh, new team members, interviewing people, also recognizing our cognitive biases and um, aiding our critical thinking. I even say go so far as to say that underneath every tech problem is a human problem. Because even when we talk about the technical challenges we face, it ultimately boils down to humans working to solve those problems. And you know, when I first started talking about this, uh, of course, I often got laughed out of the room and all that sort of thing years ago. But now a lot of people are uh, talking more and more about this. This article came out in 2020. Extreme programming creator Kent Beck, tech has a compassion deficit. Uh, you know, he was one of the original uh, people who created the Agile Manifesto, which was definitely you know, a predecessor to a lot of the things that we have going on today. Uh, the interviewer asked, if every programmer woke up tomorrow with a new habit, what would you want it to be? And he said, compassion. And he pointed out that it's a skill and it can be learned. And I had to learn it a bit uh, for my old self and I do think it's possible. Also, I, I really don't like the term soft skills. This comes from an article, uh, a recent article. For too long, we have talked about soft skills with connotations of femininity and a lack of rigor. Let's call them what they are, robot proof skills that neither men nor women can afford to face the 21st century without. So that's another way to look at it. These are really essential skills and uh, as I pointed out before, we can use them every day. The other reason I think this matters is that tech culture influences mainstream culture. And so especially as many of people are working remotely, using technology a lot more, some of the weird things about us are permeating the culture and sometimes in not so great ways. Uh, so Tim Cook a few years ago, uh, CEO of Apple said, I'm not worried about artificial intelligence giving computers the ability to think like humans. I'm more concerned about people thinking like computers without values or compassion, without concern for consequences. And I don't share this because, you know, I endorse everything Apple does, okay, not getting into that, but I think this is a good point right here. And I do think that, you know, as people are worried about chat GPT and all of these things, those are also good conversations to have, but so is this one, that we're starting to imitate some of the machines that we spend so much time on. David Byrne uh, from the Talking Heads uh, wrote this article that I referred to a lot called Eliminating the Human, great, great title. Uh, and he, this comes from that article. Human interaction is often perceived from an engineer's mindset as complicated, inefficient, noisy, and slow. Part of making something frictionless is getting the human part out of the way. <laughs> and a lot of the things we do in tech are about this. We try to make things more efficient by taking out the human part. And you have to start to wonder about the consequences when we do that uh, on a massive scale. And so I do think that sometimes spending so much time on these computers, we can start to act like one in ways that aren't the most beneficial. So that's why in this talk, I wanna focus on three specific skills for staying human uh, in spite of all of this. And one caveat, of course, is that you know we're all different and we approach problems differently and this is not actually, you know, of course you're a human being no matter what you do, you're literally a human being, so it's sort of more of a metaphor uh, for those people who want to take it more literally. Some of these ideas may resonate with you, some may not. So to that I always say, take what serves you and say, oh, well that just didn't apply. Totally fine. I'll also mention that, uh, as, I, uh, as I said earlier, I'm from the US, I uh, grew up there, I currently live in San Diego, and so that also influences how I approach this. This is from a book about cultural intelligence. And as you can see, you know, people from different countries take a different approach to some of these things. Of course, this is a massive generalization. Uh, but so I do acknowledge that. And so just be prepared that I may be more emotionally expressive and confrontational. Um, so, you know, if we get into a fight outside, you know, just, no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> all right, moving forward. So we're gonna talk about those three skills for staying human. They all conveniently start with a C, so hopefully easy to remember. You can probably guess what one of them is, but that's not the first one. Okay, so we'll start off with curiosity. Now I know what you're probably thinking, developers are great at curiosity. So curiosity is the desire to learn or know more about something or someone, is one way to look at it. Of course we're great at that. We love learning two things, right? And I agree. I do think develop as developers, we are curious often about new technologies, and why our program isn't working, definitely. But one curiosity blocker that seems to trip us up is binary thinking. Now, this is a human tendency, it's not limited to developers, uh, and it probably evolved as part of our survival mechanism because it was important to figure out something that we encountered, whether it was a threat or not, whether it was friend, friend or foe. And so our brains have evolved to do that, and it does 
serves and benefits in those survival situations. It also it gives us a sense of order, certainty, and security. So there's some benefits to it. The problem, though, with binary thinking, this either-or thinking, this or that, black and white, is that it limits our ability to learn, respond to change, and understand others. So let's talk through, through some examples. Binary thinking is good for literal binary. So if you're actually working in binary, go ahead, apply binary thinking, you need to. It's good for when we're talking about situations where there is a clear true or false, pass or fail, yes or no. But what about tabs or spaces? <laughs> Camel case or snake case? Functional programming or OOP, object-oriented programming? Spring or something else? Uh, you know, these are areas where there's not a clear answer, I would argue. You might argue the opposite. Uh, also, when we talk about good or bad code, I think, is an important area. So here is a code sample. Some of you may have seen. It was kind of uh, widely talked about online. Uh, it's from the Dutch government code. Uh, and it might be a little bit hard to read, but we have a bunch of con um, conditionals here for taking in a percentage and outputting a visual representation of it. Uh, so I'll give you a few seconds to, to look at that. Um, and if you can't read it, no worries. But some of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar uh, with this as well. So for those of you who either are reading it now or saw it previously, I'm going to ask if this code is good or bad. <laughs> so who wants to say it's good code? OK, there are some people. Who thinks it's bad code? OK, <laughs> many more people. OK, so it's interesting because in this Twitter thread, which blew up, um, there was a lot of this, terrible code, kids are writing code, code is embarrassing. Um, but there were also many defenders of the code who pointed out the readability. Uh, I kind of like this code, actually, easy to read. And so, good or bad, we had different opinions in this audience. Uh, so I would say it depends. So what is the context? What are the specifications? What is the goal? What are the priorities? What are the constraints? Uh, these are all matter to deciding whether something is good or bad. And that's why there's not, I don't think, that clear line between the two. That code specifically reminded me of an example from Sandy Metz, who is a prominent figure in the Ruby community especially. And she has this a, a example with beer, of all things, 99 bottles of beer, that song. Uh, it, it was an exercise in implementing it. So she has this book, 99 Bottles um, of, of, of OOP. And uh, in that book, she talks about like how if you want to program the song, 99 Bottles of Beer is the one that says, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 bottles of beer. You take one down, pass it around, 98 bottles of beer. And you go all the way down, right? I didn't expect to sing that, but there it happened. Whatever, I've been doing karaoke lately, so it's all good. Um, <coughs> anyway, so with that, Everyone wanted to come up with these clever solutions where it was like looping through and counting down, right? Because nobody wanted to write 99, you know, lines. But she pointed out that if you're only going to ever like implement this one thing and you're not planning on changing it, like writing out where you just write out all the lyrics in one go is not actually like a bad solution. And so she talks about this idea of shameless green, which is getting your code to pass. However, like just getting it to pass in the simplest way. So she says, this, the shameless green solution strives for maximum understandability, but is generally unconcerned with changeability. And so it reminded me a bit of that, that code sample that we just looked at. Anyway, point is, main point here, is that it's complicated. So stay curious about other people's priorities and styles, the situation at hand, because that definitely affects these things. Another binary that really gets under my skin is this technical versus non-technical idea, okay? Especially because I have a company called Compassionate Coding, which mashes them together. Uh, and so people often assume that I'm non-technical or something like that. Wearing a dress, of course, never helps um, in terms of that uh, perception, sadly, due to stereotypes. Um, but really, I argue that everybody is technical. And the reason I think that is that being technical is really about having some set of skills that you're applying. And I think that everybody has that. And so we often use it as shorthand in tech for people who code are technical and people who don't code are not. But there's so much gray area there in terms of people who are using technologies. We're all, you know, we've got computers in our pockets all the time, right? So I, I think that this idea of dividing people up is not very helpful to our industry. 
and again, I mentioned a bit about the stereotyping. I also think we tend to judge based on how people look, whether or not they're, you know, quote, technical or non-technical. Uh, and, you know, I think that I it's not great. So this is a quote from a movie where George Clooney's character says, I stereotype it's faster. And true, <laughs> and so, but that it often is faster, but it keeps you from seeing the whole human being. And so I think that's something that we can guard against. So try not to put, other, put yourself or other people into boxes, because even if you consider yourself technical, uh, these human skills are also important. So these, quote, non-technical things are also important. And you can get very technical about the psychology of these human issues. So really, I don't think there's this clear division that we often pretend that there is. So stay curious about your own interests and other people's specialties as well, and, and respect them too. Okay, so for curiosity, to sum up the tips, avoid binary thinking when it comes to human issues. Try to understand other perspectives. Read and listen to people you disagree with. I've been trying to do this more and more, especially about issues that are really important to me and that I'm even sensitive about. I try to look at the opposite side. Embrace the discomfort of uncertainty, because that's you have to if you want to avoid binary thinking. And stay humble, open to new ideas. Okay, so our next area skill we're going to talk about is creativity an important part of being human, and it builds upon curiosity. So creativity we may think of as the tendency to generate or recognize ideas, alternatives, or possibilities that may be useful in solving problems, communicating with others, and entertaining ourselves and others. This comes from a book called Human Motivation. So one creativity blocker, also from before, is binary thinking yet again. And here's how that comes into play in one way. I'm not creative. I do find this among quote unquote technical people or just you know people who code, they often say, oh, I'm not creative. Like that's the designer or that's marketing. I'm, I'm not the creative, I'm the technical person. And again, I, 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 don't, I, I just don't buy that. <laughs> uh, so I, I live by this philosophy, which is that everybody is creative. I really do believe this. Uh, so there's an organization called Creative Mornings and this is the first line from the, uh, the manifesto, they call it, that they read at the beginning. So has anyone ever been to a Creative Mornings event? There, there are two in Sweden, one there, um, one in Stockholm and then one in another city. Uh, it's a great organization and I encourage people working in development uh, to go. I go, they, they, don't, they don't check to see if you have a designer card before <laughs> you enter. Everybody's welcome because they actually do believe this, that everyone's creative. I encourage you to go and learn from people uh, too. It's, it's a great organization. So like op opportunities for creativity that you may encounter, solving problems is an application of creativity, designing architecture, naming variables, writing documentation, navigating disagreements, coming up with creative ways to do that, decorating your desk, you know what I mean? There's all these opportunities you have. Another creativity blocker is fault finding. So again, this is a human tendency. It's not limited to developers. I just think we're sadly really good at it. Um, and again, it evolved probably to protect us because it was important to look for threats in our environment, to look for the negative, to, to be on the lookout for that. So let's look through some examples. So negativity bias, this fault finding, is great for predicting security threats, testing edge cases, debugging. You're looking for the bad stuff to fix it, right? Identifying code smells. All great applications for this fault finding that we're so good at. But what about when it comes to brainstorming? So I've encountered this a lot, especially among technical teams of, that'll never work. <laughs> Hear that all the time. Uh, it comes, well, what about if we try da 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 that'll never work. No, no, tried it, no, never works. So uh, this uh, uh, former president of USC, Stephen Sample, wrote this book called The Contrarian's Guide to Leadership. And he talks about this idea of congenital naysayers, which are people like that are, are born naysayers and they act like that. He says, rather than imagining how a new idea might possibly work, they instinctively think of all the reasons why it won't. They sincerely believe they're doing everyone a favor by reducing the amount of time spent on bad or foolish ideas, but what they really do is undermine the creativity that can be harvested from thinking free. And so I do think we have this tendency because we do like have you know, those quick brains that notice, oh no, 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 that's not gonna work because of X, Y, Z. But this can prevent creativity. So an alternative comes from improv comedy. Uh, it's this technique and in design thinking as well of yes and. Now the idea here is that somebody pitches an idea to you on your team and rather than say, oh no, 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 we shouldn't do that, instead we should do this, or uh, no, I don't like that, you, you say yes and, and you build upon their idea. And so it's an alternative to being hypercritical. So a more concrete example, if they say, we could build our own dashboard to monitor these stats, you might say, that's a waste of time, we should just use X. 
some solution that's off the shelf. Another alternative would be, they say, we could build our own dashboard to monitor these stats, and you say yes, and we could also explore existing solutions. It's a minor change, but the idea here, and this is you know, one type of example of this, but it kind of helps support the idea that we're encouraging each other, and we're, you know, and so uh, I think that that can definitely aid in creativity. So look for the kernels of good, even in the ideas that seem kind of out there, especially when you're in that brainstorming, free flow kind of idea. And of course, there will come a separate time when you whittle these down and, and you do criticize them and do point out the holes and that sort of thing. But when you're generating ideas and trying to be creative, that's not the time to come in and rain on everybody's parade. Hopefully that idiom translates, but you know, be at the downer and kind of bring things down. Another creativity blocker that we sometimes fall prey to is a focus on efficiency, which again, in and of itself is not a bad thing. So to look through some examples, when you're trying to make builds or page loads faster, great time to talk about efficiency, great time to focus on that, right? That's the goal. But what about when you're stuck on a problem, when you've been working on something and you just can't make any progress uh, and, and you're just, you, you're stuck, you, hit a, you hit, a, hit a block. So our efficiency focus may think, well, I better just keep you know, hammering away on this, trying to figure it out because I don't wanna waste time. That would be inefficient, right? But a lot of times, and you may have found this, when we're trying to figure out a tricky problem, we just need to go on a walk, or we just need to get outside. We need to do something like that. Uh, Stanford University uh, confirmed this and found that uh, walking um, improves creativity. And of course, that applies to any sort of movement, right? Like moving your body in some way. This happened to focus on walking, but um, I, it applies more generally to just any sort of movement, that sort of thing. I would also say that you might find inspiration from studying other fields. You know, we, we have genetic algorithms. We have an immune system metaphor for security. Um, we use metaphors like canvas, which comes, you know, for originally from painting and that sort of thing. And so this will not come if you only focus on efficiency because it's not very, quote, efficient to like read books about some completely different topic. If you're not working in biology, it doesn't make sense, right, to read biology as far as efficiency goes. But it may spur some creative ideas. So leave room for serendipity and play in your work. Another point is to slow down and disconnect, to daydream even. Yes, just looking up at the clouds, sometimes you'll get that inspiration. And I know this may seem obvious, but I feel like we're always so like keyed into our devices and everything that sometimes we forget to just put it down and take some time. So to sum up some creativity techniques, challenge assumptions. Try the yes and technique that I mentioned rather than the no but. <laughs> Look for the good in other ideas and other people. Disconnect to daydream once in a while and explore other fields, even if they're completely unrelated. Okay, so finally, of course, we're going to get to compassion. So compassion is the feeling that arises when you are confronted with another suffering and feel motivated to alleviate that suffering. And I, I like this definition because I think a lot of times there's this idea that compassion is just about being nice. Uh, and that's, that's really not how I see it. And I don't think that that's really the essence of compassion. Compassion, I believe, is the combination of empathy and action. And this comes from literature on compassion um, in like psychology, positive psychology and that sort of thing. And the idea is that with empathy, you can understand how somebody's feeling, but compassion takes it a step further and you actually want to take action to help alleviate that suffering. And so the empathy piece can you know, break down into more complicated things. There's the emotional empathy where you actually take on the other person's feelings, but there's also cognitive empathy where you don't necessarily feel what the other person's feeling, but you can imagine it. You can take on their perspective. And I think that that is a way that is easier for developers in general because of our analytical way of thinking, but also uh, it, it helps in terms of maintaining our own emotional stability. If we get too dragged into other people's emotions, you get what some people call compassion fatigue, where you are overwhelmed with somebody else's emotions and you're unable to function, right? And so that's not good either. So anyway, so I think com this rational compassion uh, takes a different approach. Okay, so what are some blockers here? One is again, this focus on efficiency. So let's see how that applies here. So basically human interaction takes time. So I found this um, uh, page from a book outside of a train station. I walked out and I saw it there and I was like, oh, this is great. So this is the serendipity that happens when you, know, you just kind of like wander around sometimes. 
So this quote is, re re relationships thrive under one condition, carefree timelessness. You cannot schedule quality time. If you want 20 minutes of quality time, schedule three or four hours. And chances are, somewhere in the middle of that, you will have your 20 minutes of quality time. So this was actually about romantic relationships, but I think it applies in any sort of relationships we're talking about. To really connect with somebody, you need that openness. It can't be like this very rigid thing. And I do think that's part of why we're feeling often disconnected is because we're not given that kind of free range. We're you know, forced into these little meeting slots and then we kind of resent them and, and uh, people aren't really able to connect on this deep level that really gives us meaning. To return to the David Byrne quote again, as engineers, we see human interaction as you know, inefficient. And so this idea of just spending hours and hours you know, with somebody obviously seems very inefficient. Uh, so again, let's return to this example of meetings. So again, during the pandemic, yes, people started having maybe way too many meetings and taking away productive time. Articles like this keep coming out. Useless meetings waste time and $100 million a year for big companies, right? And there's something to this. None of us want to be in meetings that we don't need to be in, right? This said all the time, this meeting could have been an email, right? Uh, and, and I understand where this is coming from, and I do have compassion for it, because if you're trying to accomplish something and you're stuck in meetings where you feel like you're not getting anything accomplished, you're just wasting time, right? So this meeting could have been an email. Well, maybe, <laughs> right, is my response to that. Because I have sort of a reaction against this a little bit, because I see meetings, like this is technically a meeting, right? We're here together in a room talking. We're going to have, like, when you get coffee with somebody, um, is that a meeting? I don't know, but like I see it's humans interacting. And so a meeting is just humans interacting. And, and sure, there may be some conversations to be had about which ones are more efficient, um, what's more useful, that sort of thing. It's okay to have those conversations, but I think to just kind of blanket say like, oh, meetings, roll your eyes. Like, I'm not sure that that's the best approach. So like one very glaring example is layoffs, right? What's the most efficient way to lay someone off? Uh, maybe an email, maybe just dis disconnecting their, you know, account. And, you know, this is relevant right now a lot because a lot of people are going through this. And it's, you know, the opposite <laughs> of compassion. It's, you know, so cold to just abandon, like, to take somebody away, just send an email saying, oh, you know, you're no longer with the company or to just disable their service. It's efficient, for sure. <laughs> so if you really are just focusing on efficiency, boom, efficient. But it's not compassionate and it's not really effective, I would say, in the sense of uh, this quote from Stephen Covey who said, you simply can't think efficiency with people. You think effectiveness with people and efficiency with things. And I love this quote because I think it gets to the heart of really the work that I do with teams and, and people and my message is really this. It's that, you know, yes, we work on these machines and we're trying to be efficient with them and optimizing this and that, but with people, Sometimes it's slow and sometimes it's messy and fuzzy and you still want to be effective, you still want to accomplish things, but it really is not, doesn't always boil down to numbers. And so sometimes even like these efforts at developer productivity and this sort of thing, I, you know, I think they're, they're good efforts and I do think they can be compassionate because you know, we're trying to make people more productive, which makes people happy, which helps you know, people. But sometimes I think we focus too much on the hard numbers and we're missing out on a lot of this you know, quote, softer stuff that actually makes a huge impact on people's satisfaction, their um, sense of meaning at work, and yes, also how productive they are. Sometimes it's really about connection, human connection. And during the pandemic, this has really suffered. You know, loneliness has, was already a problem before the pandemic, and it's only gotten worse. And uh, work from home, you know, although it can be great and it can be freeing and it makes things, you know, it can be more accessible and all of these things, it's great, flexible for people in different situations. There is some loneliness that goes along with it. And I think some, I, I can't help but see a connection in between uh, this rise in meetings and that sort of thing and this sense of loneliness and like, you know, something, th there's something there, I think, that needs to be explored a bit deeper, which is not necessarily to say that more Zoom meetings are the answer to solving loneliness. So I, I was doing this remote, facilitating this remote workshop, and we were sharing some, you know, personal things and some coworkers who hadn't been in the same room for a very long time, and they weren't at this time, uh, you know, they shared some personal things. And, and one woman commented, she said, it's hard to hear this without being able to hug. And you know, I know different people have different levels of comfort with hugging, but for people who do hug, that period where we couldn't really hug people that weren't in that immediate circle was really hard. 
you know, I, I dealt with this personally because, you know, I live alone and I work alone. And, and that time was really, really challenging. And, of course, you know, I have much to be grateful for. And, and you know, it's not like a, oh, woe is me sort of thing. But, like, it, it was hard. And I do under so I do have an understanding of, of, of this issue. Uh, so um, author Arthur C. Brooks put out this article, The Trouble with Zooming Forever, and he says video conferencing affects many different kinds of brain activity. Among other things, it mutes mirror neurons, which help us understand and empathize with others. And so there's something about being in the same physical space uh, that goes on in the brain that helps us like sync up and that sort of thing. And again, people who are joining remotely, still happy to have you here and you're still getting a lot so don't mean to leave you out here but yes but there is something different about being in the same room and hopefully these people at home are in the same room with maybe loved ones or loved animals so you're also syncing up with them so which is wonderful so I had a, sp a specific instance of this come up recently in a talk that I was doing uh, live and somebody asked a question uh, that started with so I worked for many years in finance and just across the whole audience was like, oh, just because they knew it was this collective groan of like finance, because they knew we'd been talking about compassion and they knew that the finance world is often the opposite. And it was just like, I was like, this doesn't happen on Zoom. And it was one of those times where I was like, that's an example of something that we just don't really get on Zoom because people are muted and that sort of thing. And so that, that shared moment of like everybody kind of responding and that kind of thing. And I was just like, this is why even though sometimes, you know, it, it takes, like, an event like this, right, takes so much to put on, and, like, yes, I'm sure it's much easier to just do remotely, fully remotely, but, like, the value that we get for being here and sharing this experience is just so much that uh, there's magic to it. It's worth fighting for. It's worth, you know, defending, and so, yeah. So another example, uh, I took this picture uh, a number of years ago when I was at the airport uh, from Lyft, which is, like, Uber sort of thing. Get a ride from the airport without owing anyone a favor. <laughs> and I saw this and it's meant to be, you know, a selling point is that you can get to the airport, you don't have to beg somebody to give you a ride to the airport. But I was like, how sad is this, right? Because I think sometimes this idea of like giving people favors and doing nice things, that's part of what makes us human is connecting on that level of sharing, giving and taking, that sort of thing. Not necessarily making everything a transaction, right? Let me pay for a ride to the airport instead of, you know, making friends and, and sharing favors and that sort of thing. There's this great book, uh, 4,000 Weeks, that, um, by Oliver Berkman, and he talks about how, you know, Silicon Valley is all about, and, you know, tech in general, about optimizing and all this sort of thing, and making everything more convenient and smooth, and he talks about it with food delivery services and all of that. And he says, convenience makes things easy, but without regard to whether easiness is truly what's most valuable in any given context. And so he talks about even an example of services that will send somebody a birthday card for you. You, you design it all online and it will just mail it to them. And he's like, part of what makes uh, uh, sending someone a birthday card so special is you actually take the time to pick out a card and like write on it by hand and all these sorts of things. And that just doing it so easy online sometimes makes it less meaningful, makes it less human. So to that I say, sometimes do the inefficient thing. And I know this is sacrilegious to say to developers, but I, I really think that especially given our nature, making a special effort to do the inefficient things sometimes can, can open up different pathways and, and can help us stay human. So an example that I did is, uh, you know, I had stickers for sale up on my website for a while, and for every single order, I hand wrote a note along with it. It was not the most efficient way to do this, let me tell you, but people wrote about how meaningful it was and they posted in line and they said, oh my gosh, you like hand wrote me a note. And like, I was happy to do it. It was, it made me joyful. I helped me connect because I was grateful for people's support of, um, you know, my message and my company and all of that. And, uh, th but it was definitely inefficient quote, but definitely meaningful for me. So another problem uh, that, that goes along with this uh, efficiency focus is burnout or hitting the wall, as I hear it's often talked about here. And I know that here in general, you do tend to have a better work-life balance than we do, if I can even use that phrase, but you know, just to most people understand that, than we do in, in the US. But that said, I did see this article, uh, what my burnout taught me about Swedish, uh, Sweden's exhaustion epidemic, and they did talk about that it, that it is an issue here as well. And I think that that ties into this obsession with efficiency, because when we're trying to optimize and all that sort of thing, we're expecting ourselves to operate like machines, but we're not machines, and we need time to rest, and we need time to recharge, 
We need time out in nature. We need time to you know, remember that we have a body and all these sorts of things. So, uh, so I think that our burnout issues and that sort of thing, that ties into the compassion because self-compassion is a big component of compassion. Uh, I would say being compassionate towards yourself is the first step in, in trying to be compassionate towards others. And part of that is tending to burnout and tending to your own energy needs um, and finding if you need rest to rest. So another problem with this emphasis on efficiency and, and how it ties into compassion is, you know, move fast and break things, right? Like Facebook used to have that as their, their kind of motto sort of thing. And, uh, you know, which is cool when you're developing new things and you want to create new things and you don't want, uh, you don't want obstacles to get in the way to stop you from digging, building the next big new thing. But the problem is that just moving fast and all that sort of thing, we're not pausing to consider the impact of our work, right? Like, for example, Facebook and, and the influence on people and, 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 you know, countries and everything. And we're still kind of grappling with that. And there's new things all the time. And even if you're not directly working on this technology um, that, you know, affects people in that sort of way, I would say that we're all part of that community. And we all get come together at, at events like this. And, you know, with the open source communities and everything like that, there's so much, like, cross-pollination happening that you have the power to create change in, these, in this industry that will influence, you know, the effects on the global, the, the global state without, like, even if you're not specifically working on products that affect it in that way. So a, a website I recommend checking out is alltechishuman.org. What I like about this organization is it's sort of like an aggregate of a, of a bunch of different efforts to make tech more human. And it's really uh, interesting. They've got a lot of different perspectives and that sort of thing. So a, a simple technique for <laughs> to counter the efficiency thing, again, is to just slow down, literally. Uh, and uh, again, I know that that sounds problematic <laughs> from a developer's perspective. But it, it, interestingly enough, slowing down actually can improve your efficiency in the long run, right? So not that I always want to make the efficiency argument, but I will say that slowing down isn't necessarily contradictory to efficiency. Um, somebody shared a little I idea with me after a presentation one time at a company that, like, imagine somebody who's uh, walking really quickly beside a bike on the road, and so they're, like, walking down like this, and um, they're trying to get somewhere really fast, and they're walking pretty fast, and someone says, hey, you know, if you took a second to, like, pause and get on the bike, you could get to your destination a lot faster. They're like, no, no, I don't have time to stop. I have to keep going, right? And so they keep walking their bike, and it would be much faster if they would take that pause, get on the bike, and go. So just an idea to think about that sometimes we do need to slow down, and it will make us go faster in the long run. Another compassion blocker I want to return to from before, from our other uh, skills, is binary thinking yet again. This right versus wrong. So when two people come together, let's say one says, we should add this new feature. The other person says, no, 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 we should refactor the code first, right? Which one's right, which one's wrong? Well, I would argue that, again, there's not a clear answer here, no matter what the situation, because each person's bringing to the table their experiences, their beliefs, their emotions, their expectations, their values, their concerns, their hopes, et cetera. The other person's bringing their own set. So both people are coming at this with their own perspective and that sort of thing. Empathy is really about building that bridge between the two and understanding where someone else is coming from. There's not a clear right-wrong answer that is just somebody is prioritizing certain things over other things. So like when you're talking with a product manager, they have different priorities, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong, right? Or how somebody does, what programming language someone else decides to use, right? As we were talking about before. It's not necessarily right or wrong, it's about the, the situation and their preferences. So stay curious. Like to take this to the next level, there's also this problem of us versus them, where we wanna divide people into, are you with us, are you against us, and that sort of thing. And a lot of times this gets us into trouble uh, in, in many ways. You know, a lot of these open source communities, there's sometimes controversial issues come up in them. And if we view it all in terms of this, like, good, bad, like, you know, right, wrong, that sort of thing, uh, it really prevents us from finding common ground and practicing empathy. A great uh, book I recommend on this is I Never Thought of It That Way by uh, uh, Monica Guzman. And she talks about the very controversial issues, um, some of them of the day, and how even there, if we practice curiosity, we can have empathy and, and across even really big differences. 
I really like this quote from um, poet um, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. If we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each man's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. And this is really the essence of compassion right here, which is that we're all going through something, right? Uh, there's, there's always suffering somewhere. And uh, we all, whether you know, in large ways, as we've, as, as was talked about at the, the head of this, the talk, they're the head of the session, um, and small ways that may seem small, but may seem very large within the context of a family or that sort of thing. And so just remembering this, I think, can approach just how we talk to people and how we judge other people's work and, and that sort of thing. So compassion techniques, slowing down, uh, making time to connect, to truly connect on a human level, pausing to consider the impact of our work, and staying curious in disagreements, even about really important issues. So the three skills, the three Cs here, curiosity, creativity, and compassion. And again, they apply even when we're in code reviews, brainstorming, giving feedback, connecting with your team, managing conflict, writing code even, because applying creative solutions, staying curious about things, all of that um, can still apply. And yes, even compassion in the actual code. So like shorthand, if you don't remember anything else, sometimes ask what would a machine do in this situation? And then sometimes do the opposite purposefully. So to balance out binary thinking, try embracing the gray areas in life. So it's not always black and white, sometimes embrace the gray areas. To balance out fault finding, try looking for the good intentionally. To balance this obsession with efficiency, try slowing down once in a while. There's some interesting times to apply this, which is during pair programming, where it is important to be in that very analytical mindset, but you're also dealing with another person and finding that balance between, you know, trying to have empathy, but also you're kind of in that logic mode of, oh, no, no, that's not going to work, da, 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 and kind of in the zone. It's an interesting time to figure out the balance between these issues. Because again, you get to decide. So I'm not saying some of these are bad and some of these are good, because again, that would be binary thinking, right? It would defeat the, per the point. Um, I would be contradicting myself. So it's really about finding the balance for yourself. And so I really like this concept, and hopefully it, it, it applies in the situation of log home. Um, and I was like, oh, yes, this is, this is kind of the idea, right? So perhaps I'm trying to teach fish to swim here, and you're already all experts at this. But, but I do think that uh, you know, this, is a, this is another application for it. So let this conference be a start. You know, avoid trying to figure out the people that you see, like, oh, that's probably just a recruiter from the booth or that. You know, instead, just think, like, let me just get to know this person. So I'll stop trying to put them in a technical or non-technical uh, you know, category. Stay open to new people and ideas. Uh, try finding the positive in it. It's OK to be critical as well, but sometimes look for the positive. And again, try slowing down a bit, even in the midst of all this excitement. Because I know, you know conferences are so much going on, it's very exciting. But try to take a pause sometimes and just you know, reflect on the day or the people that you've encountered and, and take that pause. And again, as I, I mentioned earlier, this can really have ripple effects throughout uh, the community, the tech community, and the world. And you know, you never know the extent of that. Like sometimes people reach out to me years later because they saw something in a talk or someone shared it with them. And it's like, I never would have thought that it would, you know, get to that point. And so, you know, every action that you take can have so many ripple effects. And, you know, the conference has provided this opportunity to help out with Ukraine. And there's just so many opportunities to, to really practice being human. So with that, I will say Taksumike again. Uh, those stickers I mentioned earlier, I do have some with me. So if you find me, um, uh, feel free to ask for them. And I did try to shorten my thing a bit so we're not too much over the thing. So yes, my, my website's compassionatecoding.com. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm not yet on Mastodon. I don't know if I will be, but it's one of those situations where I feel like developers are really good at figuring that stuff out, but I know that most like normal people won't be. So I'm like, I don't want to leave where more normal people will be. So, but we'll see, maybe. <laughs> but yes, but uh, again, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, I guess that's it. Sebastian, did you get the link? Getting a sign from the technical booth. Did you get the link, Sebastian? Wave to me. Yeah, you get it? Good. So, let's see how we are with the collection.
So hope you enjoyed the keynote thing. Uh, and now we are getting that. So this is good news, I think. So we already got about 15% of the goal, but only 10% of you donated so far. So it means that the 90% there are still up doing this. Then uh, we will probably actually reach it at the end of the conference. So uh, with that said, you know how this works. So there will be a coffee break right now. You can go and uh, buy some vintage clothes at the registration desk uh, and then enjoy the day. Thank you.